So my name is Tara, and I am, among other things, um, uh, the chief scientist of Sapien Labs, which is a uh, research nonprofit uh, with the mission to very broad mission to understand and enable the human mind. And one of the so what that translates to in um, sort of practical terms is a very large scale project to understand uh, the diversity of the human brain across the globe. And how that, you know, how does the diversity of the human brain, uh, you know, what of those aspects relate to environment? And in turn, how do we then interpret what we get from the brain in the context of mental health and, and cognitive health? So, um, you know, why, uh, you know, why diversity? If any of you have any intersection with the field of neuroscience, you know that for decades people have been talking about the brain. But what we see and what I'm going to show you a little bit today is that, um, there is no the brain, right? And so what does that mean then for who we are and how we all coexist together in the world? So unlike every other organ in your body, which is exactly the same from the day you're born and pretty much does the same thing all through your life, uh, the human brain is very different. So you can see here, wait, whoops, okay. So these are neurons stained in, in um, you know, from a newborn to one month to six months, two years, and you can see that they're starting to form all these connections that actually happens uh, in response, in large degree, in response to your sensory environment. So constantly they're, you know, sending out feelers to one another and connecting with one another based on your, you know, each individual's experience of life. So the brain's going to change across the lifespan and it's also going to change very profoundly. It also then varies profoundly among individuals because each of us have a very different experience of what life is, what life is. So you guys are all very deep into the, um, you know, the specifics of urbanization, but urbanization itself in human history is very, very new. Urbanization is, is you know, a couple hundred years, 100, 150 years old from the time the first million man city came into being. And, you know, most of human history, we've lived in these small kind of rural settlements. So I'll tell you a little bit about, you know, just for the very macro ideas of how environments really has this bearing on our brains and what they, what they do based on a project that's done in India. And um, so this project is, uh, so we're up to many more people in that study now, but at the time when we put together this talk a very long time ago, it was 400. But it's a, it was a study across uh, you know, 48 different settlements. Some of them are really tiny villages which don't even have electrification, no telecommunications, any of that kind of thing, um, to all the way to you know, a 10 million person city. And uh, what does it mean? You know, what do, do brains look like in these different ecosystems? So um, we record a whole bunch of life experience, you know, aspects of their education, com communication, mobility, energy use, diet, all sorts of things. And trying to create a context for an individual's life of what's the context in which I, as each person, exists. And we use, uh, and the bread and butter of what we do as scientists here is really understand the electrical signal from the brain. There are many ways to measure brain activity, but you can see this is just a device called the Emotive Epoch, and it's, uh, you know, measure, it's, it's got a bunch of different sensors that measure electrical activity in your brain. So we record electrical activity and we're trying to say, you know, what, what can in this electrical activity tell us about the environment that the person is in, the context of their life? So here's a metric, right? So when you, when you measure this stuff, and since this is very short, I have to kind of rush you, I won't get into a lot of the details, but just hopefully conceptually. So this is like a brain signal, uh, you know, and it's, it's how do you interpret that? What does it really mean? Um, so one, one me metric that we've developed, it's called, it's, it's a, a measure of the diversity of the different patterns that your brain wave is producing and call it complexity. And you can have a lot of different, um, uh, you know, people have a wide range of complexity of their uh, brain activity, okay? If you look across something like age, maybe it's maybe kind of declining a little overall in the populations with age. There's not much difference between, no significant difference between male and female. But when you start looking at it on environmental metrics, you start seeing a whole different picture. Okay, so here's an example. So this is income. And you can see that, you know, uh, we talk about poverty line as being in the one to two dollars a day. But what you can see is that as your income increases, say this complexity of your brain signal starts to increase very dramatically as well. Um, and 
you know, income is just a proxy for things it can buy. You can buy education, you can buy nutrients, you can buy all kinds of other experiences, environments, all sorts of things. Um, education is another one. The more years of education you have, the more the complexity of your brain signals will increase. And this is a very interesting one that actually is quite um, uh, significant, is, is what we call geofootprint. And it's a, it's a metric of how far physical space you explore in your life. So how far are you going away from like the place where you're home and where you live, right? And if you look at this, uh, so this is sort of groupings uh, based on certain uh, a certain distance radius, and we think those who have sort of and you could think of one as really people who have not really wandered more than a couple miles from their home ever in their lifetimes, and there are many like that in these remote areas. Many people who are on foot, uh, you know, you can't walk far, so your whole world is like a little circle to all the way over here are people who have you know traveled all over the world and sort of you can't really map them because they've been all over the place um, but this is sort of an increasing geo footprint geo, you know spatial exploration uh, metric so what you can see is compared to things like age and gender and stuff like that like these these are just very macro environmental metrics that can have very profound um, uh, effects so I'm going to tell you about another one uh, so here you can see, like if you take people in urban environments, so this is modern, urban, college educated, your high tech people, and in these very low tech, rural, less than fifth, you know, sixth grade, maybe poorly literate, if literate at all, uh, that you know, you're starting to see two very different distributions of brains. Um, and so you can see that this sort of whole urbanization and all the things that come with it um, have really changed profoundly on you know, at this dimension and many other dimensions what our brains are actually doing. This is another metric of the of the brain, and I can't get you know in the interest of time. I'm just going to point out without telling you a lot about what all these things are, but just that there's an embedded oscillation in all in, in the brain that kind of comes up and comes and goes and comes and goes, and you can find a way to characterize it. And some people have very strong ones at sometimes, and some people you know and it's weaker one, and then maybe not at all. And um, you can see that that. Uh, don't worry about that graph, but if you just look down here, and this is a metric of the, call it the energy of the, we call it the energy of the oscillation, which means like how, essentially how strong an oscillation and how, how much fidelity that oscillation has at, at a particular frequency. And you can see here that you've got this, what you call a long tail distribution. So long tail distribution means uh, the fundamental implication of that is that there's no normal. We're all used to seeing this like bell curve with something in the middle and everyone's kind of in the middle and a little bit to this way or that way. But when you look at something like this, and this is a metric that's considered very uh, profoundly important for things like suppressing distractors so that you could focus on one thing and, and you know, different, uh, and we're still trying to figure out exactly what, what it's doing, right? But that's one of the major right now um, leading hypotheses in the field today. But what it tells you is that, you know, on many dimensions, our brain is no, we're no longer, you know, uniform in how we, we each um, think, you know, that whatever our brains are doing. And there's, where do I draw a line and say, okay, here you're normal, all the guys over here are abnormal, and, you know, what does it mean? So we really need to understand what all these factors um, mean and wh what are they saying about us, each of us, uh, for our mental health, our cognitive health, our differential abilities, and so on. So just to say that you can have a thousand-fold difference across, you know, from the, the lowest one to the highest one in, in the world. And so when we say that there's a thousand-fold difference in something in our brains, then, you know, where, how do we understand who we are collectively? But that's, um, so that's one aspect. And here again, you can see that this is very experience dependent, right? So uh, your, your oscillation energy kind of grows with income. It grows with your ability to spend fuels, but it also varies a lot. The more you know, fuel spend is a proxy for how much in the, you're kind of roaming around the world and how fast you're roaming around the world. So when we think about the brain, it's all about the rate at which the brain receives input. How fast is it receiving input? How much is it receiving integrating over time? And so um, what we can see is that not only is it growing, but it's also getting very variable. So there's a lot more variability at this end. And these people also tend to be in the more developed areas because they're the guys with cars like roaming all over the place. Um, 
So this is sort of a central point, and I showed you two different metrics that are kind of easy to explain, but there are lots of different aspects of the uh, brain signal that we don't fully, aren't able to exactly explain what they mean, but we know that they matter in an environmental context. But what this is showing you, and without getting into all the details of the, the analysis here, but you could think of what's on this axis as your context, right? So these are different metrics of your context which is like an equation of all the things of your life experience that we, uh, you know, it, the participants' life experience that we captured, and we, we create aggregate metrics out of those. And this is um, an aggregate metric of all the EEG features. This is the, the brain signal. So we take all the different aspects of your brain signal, put them together, and create a, a metric. And what you can see is that where you're, the kind of behavior your brain's gonna produce is very dependent on your context which is your life context decides to a large degree where, what the range of stuff your brain is going to be doing. And this is really very different from how we've thought about the brain because most of neuroscience has not been studied on this kind of spectrum of human experience. It's usually done on college students and college students in developed countries are a very, very tiny demographic in the world. I mean, they're less than 10%. And so, um, you know, uh, they, uh, maybe all the studies are kind of up here, and most of the people, 80% of the population of the world lives down here. Um, but so really this is just to show you how profoundly um, experience matters, our environment and the experience matters to what our brain is gonna do and what it's going to become. And in the broad context, while you know, we talk about all the details of urban planning, the fact that ur urbanization itself is a big driver of this trajectory uh, because all the folks you see at this end are all generally urban <laughs> dwellers. Okay, so, so that's really the crux of it and I just wanted to give you that perspective is that, you know, that what we do and how this environment evolves is going to profoundly drive how our brain is going to behave and therefore what outcomes we have. So I'll hopefully tie in the next just one or two minutes uh, um, to something that may be more practical relevance to some of the things you guys are all doing. So, um, so we, you know, I showed you some macro aspects of environment, and you can always, you know, study these kind of things at more finer levels, like rather than just whether you're urban or rural versus this kind of urban environment and that kind of urban environment. But the question is really then, you have all these differences in brain signals. What does it mean for mental health? And you know, when we started down this path, our, our large-scale study is to say, how do we study across tens of thousands of people or hundreds of thousands of people, get brain signals, understand their context, and then get some metric of mental health. And when we think about mental health, there's so many different aspects. And I think a couple of people this morning said, oh, um, you know, there's so many ways to measure mental health. And if we're going to, you know, from our perspective, from the research perspective, we said if we're going to study large-scale mental health, we need a metric of mental well-being, and we don't have a metric of mental well-being in the world today because all of the clinical aspects are done on a disorder-based kind of, the doctor decides your diagnosis before he actually assesses you in some sense, right? And so what we did was we created a metric of, um, like a top-line metric of mental well-being, and we call it the MHQ, it's like the mental health quotient. Mm -hmm. um, and the way we did that, so I don't have a lot of, uh, slides, but it's just basically a tool to measure population mental well-being. And the idea being that you'll have a second order level like the MHQ clinical, which will then drive down in deeper into like particular clinical diagnosis, but you still want a metric of, you know, what is mental well-being overall and can we, can we kind of pin it down to a number that we can measure against and see if we're doing something to change this metric of population well-being. So, um, so the way, I, you know, I, I just have this one slide on it, but I'll try and communicate a little bit what it, what it does. So the way we developed this is we took 116 mental health diagnostic tools, which are from all across the mental health spectrum. So every different um, mental health disorder that there is, there is all these assessment tools that are based on the DSM or the ICD-10, and um, they will ask a set of questions about, um, you know, symptoms. And, and right now for, you know, there is no real biological basis to mental health disorder uh, categories. They're just arbitrary clusters of symptoms, which are very vague. And you know, even within the same disorder, two different assessment tools assess two different sets of symptoms, part, you know, partly overlapping, but 
lar you know, very, uh, uh, with a lot of variability. So it's, it's very murky what, what any of these disorders actually are. Um, but we took 116 mental health diagnostic tools that exist or are used out there today and said, how do we bring it down into something that's like one tool that can be done in less than 15 minutes? That was the goal. And so we took that, we came up with, you know, 170 different symptoms across these 116 assessment tools. And then those were sort of collapsed into 45, uh, 43 in a, um, major symptom categories. And we used that to then develop and added a few others to, to basically develop a tool which has two, two components. One is um, like things that are spec what we call spectrum aspects, which are things that um, they can be an asset to your life. You could also have a problem with them. So it's not only, you're not only assessing problems, you're also assessing the things that can be enabling your life. Because when you talk about well-being, you want to be also encompassing the positive aspects of it. Um, and so, and then pro specific psychiatric kind of problems. So all of those together, we have an overall score, and then we ha we have you know sort of sub scores, and then we can provide like risk areas and what you know what are the risk areas for this group and what are the risk areas for that group, and really now we're looking at bringing it into ways of you know for example workforce uh, you know, companies that want to measure and track mental well-being. How do I and then you know have interventions or maybe in, in urban design, am I accomplishing you know, better outcomes of mental well-being and stuff like that. So, so that's just an, um, you know, in terms of measurement, what our hope is that, is that we'll be able to then also tie this to the brain signal and be able to say, uh, to you know, translate it into brain health outcomes. But I think for overall, uh, this, this is a way for us to understand at population levels where we stand on well-being and what are the areas that we are struggling with and what, how interventions actually are moving different metrics. So um, that's all I have and if, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer.